Kathleen Gripsky, faculty, students, members of the community, staff of Cumberland University, welcome to the Vice Library. This is what we call the main reading room. Today, we're going to acknowledge and celebrate uh, National Poetry Month. That's April, of course, and this is part of uh, the library's speaker series. This is the April edition of our speaker series where, where we have a monthly speaker come in. When I was thinking about getting speakers, uh, a speaker for April, I thought about a professor analyzing, you know, one of the great epic poems. Then I thought some more about poetry. And poetry is really meant to be read aloud to the reader or to other people. So I started focusing on doing a, a poetry reading. I got in touch with assistant Professor Gertz because I know she had written some poetry. And lo and behold, she had just finished writing some poetry. Uh, further, she was aware that Dr. Stuart Harris had been writing <coughs> some poetry. So to make a long story short, uh, Dr. Harris and Assistant Professor Gertz are our featured speakers today. Uh, we will also may have some contributions from the English 216 class uh, seated to my right. And I'll turn it over to them at this point. Thank you all so much for joining us for our poetry reading today. Um, I'm Jamie Fleming, and I will be introducing Dr. Stuart Harris. Um, Dr. Harris is a professor of English, and he is the program director for English at our very own Cumberland University. He has published poems in journals such as West Branch, The Panhandler, and The Archer. He has published stories in South Dakota Review and in an anthology, A Tennessee Landscape, People, and Places. In 1995, he won third place in the Tennessee Writers Alliance Short Story Contest. And I have the privilege of calling him my professor here at Cumberland. Um, my favorite anecdote that I have for Dr. Harris is in class, um, he told us, and he tells us every time we read poetry, that he had a professor once who told him that to write poetry, you have to have to write poetry. <laughs> you can't write poetry unless you have to. And I use that philosophy in my own work. I say, do I have to write this poem? <laughs> and, <laughs> and if the answer is no, then it's probably going to be weak. Um, and I believe that that philosophy can be applied to not only poetry, but probably all aspects of life as well. Um, without further ado, here is Dr. Harris presenting his own work. And when I grow up, I want to be Jamie Fleming. <laughs> Sarah Cox wants a new haiku. The heron looks down, disappointed. That's my first poem. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, over 20 years ago, I was doing a, uh, a speech on Clyde Edgerton's depiction of the South in transition, and I was about less than five minutes into my presentation when the door opened up and two gentlemen walked in late to the meeting, Will Campbell and John Edgerton. And I felt like the fool standing in the front of the room talking about Southern culture. Today I walk in and one of my heroes' heroes is sitting here on the third row. Uh, Robert Stone, it's very nice to have you here today. Thank you. And I prefer not to read anymore at this point. Uh, I wrote a great deal of poetry over the last summer. I used to write short poems that I could put, put on half a page and read you in a minute, 
Today I'm going to read you four poems, and that will take most of 15 minutes. I'm not sure what happened, but now I tend to write longer poems. Sometime this coming summer, I plan to take what I did last summer and turn it into some sort of chat book. And um, I'm not sure what it will be called, and I'm not sure of the shape of it, but I'm pretty sure which poem has to be first and which poem has to be last. This poem is called What I Went Looking For. I'm supposed to take this off, am I? At the end of the lesson on utopia, the teacher gives the students 10 minutes to design their own, just jot some notes and then share. The results are predictable. No racism, no hunger, no political parties, plenty of everything for everyone. Then the one weird guy who sits in the back every day smelling of soil and giving everyone a nickname, doodling drawings of animals, plants, clouds, beaches, and naked women sighs aloud. The teacher tries to draw him into the discussion for once. Adam? He sighs again. The place I come from, it was all right, I guess. I'm saying it wrong. It was amazing, perfect even, you might say. But that, he looks out the window as a bird alights on a branch and thinks, that was the problem. We had everything we needed. Plants just grew. Food was just there. And Eve was, he looks out the window again where the bird has flown away. Eve and I had some amazing times, that's all I'm saying. Making air quotes with his ink-stained fingers, he adds, but you can only have amazing times so many hours of the day. Afternoons turned into their own eternities. In the morning, it's nice to sit and watch the birds and butterflies, the animals coming to the water, but then at some point you just need something to do. That one day, the, one, the only one anyone wants to talk about, I left Eve alone. I was out wandering, searching to see if, I've miss, if I'd missed something. Was there any excitement to be found, even a task that needed completion? I confess that I even wondered if there might be another woman somewhere, one with a different hair color, maybe red, with smaller breast or larger breast, maybe a piercing, but nothing. So I went back and Eve had found what we both had been looking for. The fruit was delicious, but honestly not all that much better than any other fruit we had been eating, but the mere eating of it seemed to create that push and pull we had been missing. Eve had pulp on her lips and I put my hand on the back of her neck and kissed her harder more urgently than ever before. Our tongues reached greedily for fruit. Our hands probed skin which seemed brand new. Later that day we invented clothes. And then of course God showed up. One rule, he said. I gave you one rule. Everything was harder after that, I guess. I didn't spend my long afternoons looking for a secret after hours club hidden somewhere among the flowers. I sweated. The sex was better though, something we had stolen. No, something we had created for ourselves. Eve said the same, even after her screams of pain, bringing Cain and then his brothers into the world. Things died, plants, animals, then what Cain did to Abel. Senseless, but I suppose it was somehow part of the push and pull I had wished into the world on my afternoon walks. After that, a hole opened up inside of me and I felt like it would never close. Abel gone, and then Cain gone too with that weird new tattoo and talking with a woman we didn't even know existed. But the hole, the pain, 
the work. I'm not sure it's all that different from what I went looking for. This next poem, thank you, Eric. This, <laughs> this next poem is called Driving Away. This is the only poem I'm reading today, which I've read to some of you before. Uh, I wrote this poem about 18 months ago. It's called Driving Away. <clears throat> I've been to kiss my mother goodbye. Are you going to work, she says. I'm going home, I answer. Work, she says. No, home. Work home work home work home she finally just shrugs as if home were a ridiculous place to go at 715 in the coming dark of a cool evening in the middle of September driving west I watched the last vestiges of pink and orange slip into nothing I tried to visualize my mother's brain filled with blood 18 months ago, now struggling to make sense, to make connections. Is it the size of an egg in the chicken house or of a walnut fallen in the front yard of the house in Claysville, Alabama, where her family sharecropped the happiest days of her life, she once told me, months before the morning when she came to breakfast and asked me if I had found the sheets in the bathroom. I had already fetched the towels from the dryer and managed to let her know this. In the car, my daughter, wide-eyed, said, Daddy? She said, Side Lake. I know, I said, driving away taking Mia to a swim meet and a graduation party and then home, only to return the next evening to pick my mother up off the bathroom floor, dress her, and take her to the ER. Are the neurons a frayed network where the ends don't quite meet? A 60-year-old star flower quilt with the stuffing exposed. A dress worn too many Sundays, a coat that has been worn for too many winters, stretched thin in the interest of shoes, books, corn. What does it feel like to hear the words leave her mouth different from the words in her egg-shaped or walnut-sized mind? To have this fool just keep repeating home as if that were a place one could go. Is it like trying to communicate with a 20-year-old son who knows it all, who just comes home on weekends to eat, wash clothes, show off his newfound college ideas, use words like social constructs, hegemony, deconstruction, Derrida, this son who is always already driving away. Thank you. This is called Grace or Public Works. My mother's house, the house I grew up in, emptied and sold. All of the documents signed, a change of address applied for. I drive a, I drive a final truckload of the remains across town, a couple of large plastic garbage cans full of odds and ends milk crates, dishes, many framed pictures, children, ball games, graduations, marriages. Deadlines met, bound to the past no longer. I am free of the urgent burden of emptying rooms of my life, my mother's life, and do not want to make this drive across town again anytime soon. But somewhere north of Brentwood on I-65, one of the two plastic garbage cans shimmies, then flies out of the back of the truck. My first thoughts are of liability, 
a flight. Surely no one was hurt behind me. I press the accelerator a little harder. What is behind me is not my doing. But then I pull off at the next interchange and chart a circuitous back roads path that will take me back to the spot. As I approach, I am relieved that this is no accident scene, no ambulances, no flashing blue lights, little evidence that I passed that way 20 minutes earlier, just a crushed plastic garbage can in the median amid other unidentifiable debris. I drive away from the scene a second time, somewhat relieved, still afraid that I left damage behind, afraid that I will receive a call that someone captured a license plate. What is a reasonable penalty for all of our daily small decisions, not even decisions, actions without deliberation. This garbage can will fit here. Never considering the need to secure it or at least fill it with some heavier bits of a life salvaged and relocated. For careless words, jibes, missed appointments, a kind word unsaid, a tree not planted, a misplaced lustful glance, a healthy lust unspoken, not acted on, a judgmental thought, a chance to drink with friends missed, one drink too many. If we could circle back and record the debris we leave behind, would we want to? Could we bear it? So I drive, burdened with the weight of each moment, praying for mercy in my one fragile life for all fragile lives, wanting to atone for all the garbage that I've left on the side of the road for grace or public works. I, I am happy to report that Friday morning I will be hiring two men in a truck. <laughs> this last poem is called Codas. I hate the title. When I'm done, somebody come up here and tell me what the title of this poem is supposed to be. <laughs> Mary and Mary and Salome encountered a young man who told them he was alive but they were scared and didn't tell anyone or they came and told Peter and the rest of us or maybe he appeared only to Mary Magdalene still smelling of sweet perfume and she came and told all of us as we were mourning trying to make sense of a huge new absence in the center of our lives. If she came, we didn't believe her. We had seen him die. We know what death is. Accounts vary. Of course, if the three women just ran away scared, then how do I know all of this? Where do I even find the voice to tell you this story? My syllables are just a scribbler's cynical trick, a metafiction. So he must have come to us when we were eating, scolding us, because we know what death is. He said some hard words. Those who keep believing in death will be condemned. Those who don't can drink poison and play with snakes. He said we would speak in strange tongues. Luke remembers it differently. He showed us his hands and feet. He ate fish with us. Luke remembers soft talk of forgiveness, raised hands, blessings, but I remember something harder and stranger in the air 
judgment and an otherworldliness in his eyes. I don't even remember the trip to Bethany, though Luke swears we walked. I just remember he was gone again. But somehow this second absence, this absence after impossible presence was softer, compelling us to share, to tell people, to shape words that helped some people stop, stand up straight, and lay their sicknesses aside. Everybody. My name is Elijah Jacobs. I hope all of y'all are having a wonderful day today. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, first off, I'm going to be uh, introducing uh, Professor Gertz over here. She's a native Western Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take this off. <laughs> it's be a lot easier. <laughs> so, she is from Western Pennsylvania and a graduate of Wilkes University, uh, Wilkes University's MFA program, that is. She's an author of a poetry collection, The Pattern Maker's Daughter, a uh, Sandberg Lodgeway Award winner, and was nominated for a Pushcart Prize. She has published poems, memoir, and essays in literary journals, including Poet Lore, Green Mountains Review, The Ledge, Everyday Poems, and was featured as one of 16 working class poets in world literature today. In 2020, her memoir excerpt, Some Girls Have Oars of Bright Colors, was featured at the right launch and her fiction was announced as a finalist of the Porch Prize. This spring, she has seen new poems accepted at Cathexas Northwest and Northern Appalachia Review and has had work accepted into the anniversary ed edition of the Keystone Poetry Anthology. And Professor Gertz is continually inspired by the students she is honored to teach in English and Creative Writing at Cumberland University. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, and thank you for the invite, Stephen. Um, before I do my reading, I have to get this out of the way because I made my class do recitations, so I have to do one of my own. And I'm going to leave my words over here because they can't compare to the Walt Whitman. Um, and Walt Whitman, Dr. Harris, and I share a love of him. And this is from Song of Myself, Passage 48. And I say to any man or woman, let your soul stand composed before a million years. And I say to mankind, do not be curious about God, for I who am curious about each am not curious about God. No array of terms can say how much I am at peace about God and them. I see and behold God in every object, yet not understand God in the least. Nor do I understand who could be better than myself. Why should I wish to see God better than this day? I see something of God in every hour of the 24 and in each moment then. I see in the faces of the men and women I see God, and in my own face in the sky. I see letters from God dropped in the street, and each one is signed by God's and I leave them there. For I know wheresoever I go, others will punctually come forever and ever. Sorry, I get so crazy about Whitman. Whew. I can't, like, my students know. It's like praying or something. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if I'd be here without the great Walt Whitman's inspiration. So I'm going to read um, six poems, and I hope that they tell a story, and I hope that I don't talk too much in between. I hope that you'll see the trajectory of the story. I'm very much a poet of place, and um, <laughs> to understand my story, you'd have to know that I feel a deep connection with Western Pennsylvania, and particularly the borough I grew up in, and I'm a Steeltown girl. So I was going to read all new stuff, 
But I have two poems from my book, The Pattern Maker's Daughter. My dad was a pattern maker in the steel mills. And so this is going to move from very formal, and there's the only formal poem in my book in iambic pentameter, um, and then move to very narrative, lyrical, hybrid stuff. This is Milltown Girls in Flight. This was inspired by going back to my old neighborhood and thinking that the trajectory, the downward trajectory of the steel mill's demise would show in the children that I went and worked with. And I found out that, surprisingly, it didn't. It was still kind of Mayberry for them. Glittering sandals rain from charcoal skies where German girls of Dale dress Barbie dolls to alight and vault across the valley's bowl of mountains formed by rivers' rapid rise. In swimming suits and halter-tied lace wings, the Milltown girls untouched slip by the loss of furnace blast and steel dust fables tossed. Their playgrounds crown a lucky queen and king. Their hills protect from rage as well as storm. They shield their souls in mortared shells of brick, protect from fear when dark night fires are lit, when whispered sighs on breath fog windows form. Each blonde face glows white as porcelain. Each porous cherub cheek is luminous. Their feet of flip-flop grace atop the crevice of Allegheny Mountain Gap and spin across the river flask to Foundry Gate and float atop the grizzled men in line. Their molten makeup and scissor clothes apply to Barbie forms and in toy ovens bake, the recipe for gathering the suns. Below the nugget steaming furnace blaze, millmen are unaware their daughter's gaze. Their metal toes shake off the specks of dust. And so to show <laughs> another poem that thank you, that shows uh, my connection to what was underneath the ground there, um, I went and dug a bit deeper. And I'm going to, since I'm in a library, We'll be doing this in my advanced poetry class this fall. Using found research um, is a big part of what I do. And this is um, with some found information from a geography of Pennsylvania. So I like to, wherever I live, try to connect the self to the environment and the, um, the underground, part of this earth. This poem has parentheses, so I'll try to denote when the parentheses are. I am rooted in this Appalachian bedrock, a sliver of the Earth's volcanic events, ancient as Africa, shiny as new slag scraped from our hillsides, high as the Rockies that walled us in, our lilting speech, our bent shoulders and inhibitions, as it stretched in infancy from Mexico to Newfoundland. Digging in childhood halls, I see roses grown from thin patches, seeds scattered over the cracked alley yards, school children picking at slim violets, just under this surface, I am half Piedmont, half woman, half informed of my senses, traffic laws, library etiquette. My eons keep eroding. My origins are here, the part in my scalp, spaces between teeth, soft bones, and impressions on sedimentary rocks. They speak from layers within layers, seek the bottom of deep oceans, travel in shallow seas over the history of ancient beaches, river valleys where I'm polished and rubbed. I am shale, common and conglomerate, the dirty inside of a purse, caked over lipstick, torn receipts and dried gum, skeletons of organisms drifting. I am rapidly moving streams, carbon rich, organic, coal compressed. I am evolving, changing, volcanic, standing up straight, learning to walk across the room, raising my eyes from the floor. I form a thick sequence. I stack myself eight miles high. I am a prize for geologists. Under great heat, violent under pressure, I am shale, changed to slate, into schist. Settling into dirt, I am shaking the hand of who I am becoming. I am sitting on top of a trembling earth. Thanks. So moving forward, my story is, uh, um, God, eight years ago now, I was literally picked up by the wind back home. And it was kind of an omen. And a month later, I found myself in Nashville <laughs> and found and thought I was going to be here for three weeks and found out that my 22-year marriage was over when I got down here and I never returned to my old life. And so 
since then, in the last five years, I also lost both my parents suddenly, and a house, and a marriage, and some other things, and some pets. But it's, I'm not saying that as a downer. I actually have been writing a lot about it and see it as a great mystery. But the one time that your past sort of haunts you is, um, and I know some people have recently lost lost um, their parents as well, is it, it gets you in these little moments. And so this is called security questions. Because have you ever had to write your security questions to get into your bank account or something? And then later you realize, what? Well, one of them in the poem I actually didn't know was public. So <laughs> I had to be asked by the person on the phone. I thought they were all private questions. So this is about that kind of thing. It's a question and response. Security question. What is your childhood best friend's name? I haven't seen her in decades. The last time is a vision of her fading into the western Pennsylvania night as she flicked her ashes in some alley, some hiding spot from parents, her Levi's pulled in at the waist. You really should make up with her, all my old friends say, their voices ringing in my ears as I struggle with the password for the site. Our parties and car rides, hydroplaning through REO speed wagon summers, the year 1982 choking me as I just want to access my bank balance. What is your late mother's middle name? The same as mine, Lorene. I should have changed this the day she began appearing in my dreams, radiant with 1990s mom hair. In only one dream since she left us was she old, a grade smiling woman I drove on narrow roads to a far off cabin asking, am I going the right way, mom? And only one was she angry. She came to me pacing as I laid in the tiny Paris bed two days before dad, her husband of 65 years, would pass suddenly after yard work. I told him what to do. He just won't listen. What is your father's middle name? Gustav, first name William, one half of him old world and reserved as the Black Forest, unable to talk about money like the Italians of our old neighborhood, the cost of shoes or the puncture marks he makes in closed curtain polling places. The other side carefree and tossing a football to grandkids in the steel gray of a carbon sky, the pattern shop dust still on his boots, the last video I have of him pumping his legs on a hotel fitness bike backwards for fun, the day he came in from the lawns, mowers roar, heart pounding to the cold bathroom with mom's peach hand towels. I was sleeping on a chair in Chicago O'Hare and missed my flight. The calculation sense of what I was doing when he fell alone, the reunion with mom, hoping I wasn't sipping the bad Chardonnay at the chain seafood place or arguing with a flight steward about baggage. Who is your twin flame? The woman from the Minnesota Lutheran Finance Company asked me, her accent as though she holds many marbles in her mouth, while holding my life savings in a note in her desk. When I thought these questions were for my use only, she coughs nervously like church basement coffee people I see on brochures for annuities and spiritual sacrifices, like Habitat for Humanity. Smiling from glossy pages with linked hands, I answer wincing, Troy, thinking that any access to my savings should be painful, painful as his dry goodbyes, the pierce of his voice like vodka on old voicemails, the flicker of eyes when he walked into the meetup bar, the suburban golf shorts I fell stupidly for by the end of drinks when I'd never dated a man that tall, that blonde, and when walking to the car, how I grabbed instinctually for his pink cotton shirt in an awkward hug that felt like clutching at the roots of trees. What is the name of your pet? Madagascar, but this is four cats ago and he's long expired. Do you really want me to relive his respiratory reeses, the fading of his tuxedo coat, the weary trips he took to the water bowl each day until the cold steel table? Everyone I chose in my security questions is gone from me, and yet I typed in their names as though it was a good idea, as though they were the ones I'd always remember. Thanks. <laughs> Very appreciative. Um, so this is uh, a bit of a prosy prose poem that has turned into a hybrid memoir. So I don't know, we could call it a prose poem or a memoir in verse. And um, this is Orogeny of Wind going to Nineveh. I saw Nashville as Nineveh at one point, like from the Bible. 
one way to avoid a root canal is to be picked up by the wind outside of periodontist's office on Route 19 South Pittsburgh. I am late because the wind picked me up, I told the receptionist, brushing off my jeans, picking off thorns from my hair and threads of my sweater. This same gray building of assage of cubicles is where I once walked with a panther on a leash, says an artist who dreamed it, though his, this man is one to paint only in black, his suffering women. From childhood, I knew I was not light enough for elements to lift me the same way I knew the heaviness of steel and the inhibitions of the Kanama Gap, my father's inability to push his hips through a turnstile. Years from now, I will say it was the birds that drove me to Nashville, but it is said the wind is the Holy Spirit in Pittsburgh that day. I thought no one is picked up by the wind in the suburbs, but yet I flew into the landscape arteries of the Deckman building while hairdressers on the first floor salon peered out at me, landing in the blunt cut evergreens. Months later, displaced to Tennessee, I saw how the Mississippian era natives had also vanished from the flat bottoms of Shelby Park, where once they built thriving towns and mounds, coaxed shapes from clay, and made a massive sculpture named Sandy. All we know is that when long hunters came hundreds of years later, the land was wiped clean, leaving only traces for archaeologists to dig up and place in the Smyrna Museum. Today in Music City, once named French Lick and then Nashboro, we travel over the tops of burial grounds on the way to baseball games at Sulphur Dell, hearing only slight aches, thinking they are distant trees bending. In Sumner County, just east, they say the message came to them in a flash, a divine scorching of the earth that bore a crater into the ground. Burning for days, the natives huddled in their tents. It meant go, they decided. The same way my son received his omen while pulling down the handle of a barista's espresso lever that month before we left, you have to protect mom, it said. He never told me. I only knew that driving the safe streets of our city in winter, he'd call, where are you, he'd ask. I'm driving from the gym to the grocery store as banal and safe as bread. But in one month, I'd find myself touching the paisley patterns of bedspreads in my house, the pegged woodwork and precocious oak lines and the wood flooring, marveling at the century of old grains. I'd run my hands over everything twice. I don't want to go to Nineveh, I told my husband, his sinister reassuring it would be just three weeks. Tennessee is supposed to be the state of volunteers, yet I did not raise my hand. The day I signed the papers, I can't even recall. I never cared for dates or tradition or the new dark birds that followed us to downtown Music City, how they'd brush against my cheek with something insistent, the predators and the power lines that swooped and dared me to run. On those days, my son would sprint to catch up with me in the whipping gusts of Church Street, calling out across the ripping wind that bounces off skyscrapers and tears your eyes, his breaths heaving, are you okay? Okay. Yes, it is cold in the south too. It's windy and icy, and yet the air lacks the ability to make one snowflake. In that frigid dawn, he told me of heating up quiche and frothing milk, the words that came to him like the Mississippian mound builders who had listened to the sky scorching their forest floor. After the orogeny, I learned the language of Tennessee sunsets, the violent storms of the Cumberland Plateau. I had forgotten my senses, cried at the perfectly drawn lines of sidewalks when I'd accidentally stepped in the suburbs, astonished there could be something so uniform. I could not drive to a mall from three years for fear I would see my old life in a mirror. The peonies of Pittsburgh blooming would be blooming the first week of June. There would be a month's worth of fires before then in the long Pennsylvania winter. I would certainly need to be there to fan the flames to be sure the sparks that escaped were never left burning. Thanks, and my last poem is, um, takes a societal turn, political turn, and um, this is the magic sundust car wash written the day after Charlottesville, but in the light of our current times perhaps is <sighs> appropriate. The Magic Sundust Car Wash. At the Magic Sundust Car Wash, it all works orderly. You pull in for cleansing, and the boys who move the brushes across your windshield are kind and have many teeth. Their waving arms guide you to the right grooves, then dunk you in a violent baptism. 
In the roomy parking lot, you wait for vacuums, first come, first serve. We are every color here and silent in a hollowed wiping of our interiors or deaf in the whoosh of the attachments that lift the grime of yesterday. The image is still surfing, surfacing in our rear view mirrors. We hear a tire blow out and startle. We watch the pastor who's come in his white collar shake hands with a biker, all of us buffing and shining. I always come full of shame, the gum encrusted in the ashtray, the miles of driving with a cup left to bubble in the noonday heat. My neighbors at the car wash make me cry with their earnest kneeling to car mats, how they bend their backs to place them on the concrete to hose as genuine as any prayer. As I watch, I think of wanting to be that clean, to forget I was never cast as Mary in the nativity scenes of Beulah United Methodist Church, to forget that I had seen the universe and all its empty promises poured out in Tupperware cups of Mad Dog Flush. At the magic sundust car wash, I wanted only for the dash of my Mazda to be unglued from my hands that have gripped the wheel with chicken fingers and too much honey mustard. But then I wanted the concentration of the old brown man with the convertible patiently gliding his sponges across the waxed gleam of his hood. I wanted to be the lady in curlers, Saturday white painter's pants and cigarette hanging as she shakes mats in the afternoon sun of the south. All of us acting as though we didn't have a president who tipped us over by pressing our faces to the dirt. We already knew we were all unclean, but after an hour at the sun dust car wash, we are free and gritless and light. We roll back the vacuum hoses carefully in a circular, orderly fashion. And as we drive out, we promise ourselves we will never be dirty again. Thank you so much. All right, so next up from our contemporary poetry class, we have Jamie Fleming. She's going to be reading, All of My Friends Are Finding New Beliefs. Hello again. So um, I graduate in two weeks, and... Uh-huh, uh, you are much more excited than I am. Uh, I am a bit petrified, a bit relieved. Um, and as I grow older and as I get closer to that dreaded date, I am finding that my friends are changing. They are evolving. They are adapting, as uh, a Darwinist would say. Um, and Christian Wyman has a poem called all my friends are finding new beliefs. And it speaks to me on levels that are a little too accurate, so <laughs> I'm going to read that for you today. All my friends are finding new beliefs. This one converts to Catholicism, and this one to trees. And a highly literary and hitherto religiously indifferent Jew, God womps on like a genetic generator, Paleo, keto, zone, South Beach, bourbon. Exercise regime so extreme she merges with machine. One man marries a woman 20 years younger and twice in one brunch uses the word verdant. Another brick-fisted belligerence gentles into dementia and one, after a decade of financial faints and teases, like a sandpiper at the edge of the sea, decides to die. Priesthoods and beasthoods, sombers and glees, high-styled renunciations and evocations of dirt, sobrieties, <laughs> satieties, pilgrimages to the very bowels of being. All my friends are finding new beliefs, and I am finding it harder and harder to keep track of the new gods and the new loves and the old gods and the old loves and the days have daggers and the mirrors motives and the planets turning faster and faster in the blackness and my nights and my doubts and my friends, my beautiful, credible friends.
Next up, we have Daniel Sutherland. He will be reading Mill Doors by Carl Sandburg. I'm going to come up here because I am tall. Um, I'm going to be honest. I have been a creative writing major for one semester, this semester. I only figured out creative writing was a major last semester when I got into Miss Gert's class. We started our poetry unit in that class, and I said, I suck at poetry. I know nothing about it. I don't know how to read it. I don't know how to write it. This is going to be awful. And then she told me I was really good. <laughs> Go figure. So, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to read this <laughs> and hope it goes well. <clears throat> you never come back. I say goodbye when I see you go in the doors, the hopeless open doors that call and wait, and take you then for how many cents an hour? How many cents for the sleepy eyes and fingers? I say goodbye because I know they tap your wrists. In the dark, in the silence, day by day, and all the blood of you drop by drop, and you're old before you were young. You never come back. That, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> Bring it down here because I'm short. <laughs> so now it's my turn. Uh, I'll be reading uh, Some of Life by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And just to give a little preference of this poem, I read this for the first time when I was 13, and since then, uh, anytime someone's like, do you know any poetry? This is the only poem that I know. Like, I don't know why, but it just is. Let's see. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art, to dust thou turnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow find us further than today. Art, art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums, are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bovac of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle, be your hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant, let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within, and God o'erheard. Lives of great men all remind us, we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. I should have mentioned this earlier. If anyone in the audience feels compelled to read today, you, you know, you're more than welcome to step to the podium. Please, come on.
of grace for a race so wretched and undeserving of the glory that flows from his majestic throne. And then uh, the other one I was going to read um, is one that a friend told me uh, was one of their favorites when I was sharing some of my writing. So this is called Emotionally Mute. I laugh, I joke, I giggle, I play, yet deep within my voice is bound with chains. I can write and I can draw, but to these but to these things no sound my tongue may ever make. No expression of feeling can my lips let escape. Emotionally mute and frozen with fear, I close my eyes and wish that I wasn't here. I know what I want to say, yet my tongue is tied like an airtight alibi. I pray day after day for the pain to subside, and to this God, and to this request God's only reply is speak, though to speak I have tried with no avail. For I have a noose on my voice box wrapped around my vocal cords by the pit of hell, tightening with every word I try to expel. Wasn't that exceptional? Just exceptional. Oh, Mike? Google it. You can get the pronunciation of words, which is which is, which is what I, which is what I did. I gave him a choice between several. This is entitled "An Ode to Joy," which I think represents my um, my attempt to claw myself out of. Uh, I think it's been a pervasive depression that many of us have, uh, have felt the past 18 months or so um, in lieu of upping my antidepressant, I thought I'd write a poem. What is joy? Joy is when God shares heaven's smile with us and we smile back. I saw joy the other day. I think it was joy. It was a fleeting glimpse. A mirage? Wishful thinking? Joy has been hiding. Better, joy has been hidden. By fear gone wild. By death. So much. I saw Joy the other day. I saw her in the courageous congressman who spoke the truth and was condemned by his family. I saw her when another Confederate statue was removed. I saw her in the BLM protester shaking hands with a police officer in riot gear. I saw her as the toxic dark cloud lifted and DACA students 
were able to breathe again. I saw her when a people said they could finally breathe. I saw her when the number of COVID deaths decreased. I saw her in the tears of our president as he joined the nation in grieving over the deaths of over 500,000 persons. I heard Joy the other day. I think it was Joy. It had been a while since I heard her. All I've been able to hear are vociferous voices voiding veracity. I heard Joy as someone said, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I forgive you. I need help. I don't know. I can't imagine what you're going through. I see more in you than you can see right now. You're more than your failure. Here I stand, I can do no other. The world needs people like you. Thank you for being you. I don't know what to say, so if it's all right with you, I'll just sit with you a while. What happened to you is wrong. You have a right to be angry. You have more time to complete the assignment. I will take care of it for you. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. You're not yourself today. Do you want to talk about it? I heard Joy the other day. She wasn't a memory whispering. She was a song. The song was imagined. Is there anyone else? Ms. Short. <laughs> Whoa. Sorry. Come on. There. Pick this baby up. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kiana. Uh, this is a, I think it was my very first spoken word piece that I wrote like many years ago but I kind of felt led to read it so it's called confidence they say I used to be a confident kid that I never let the ver verbal bullets from others hurt me they wanted to know where the old me had gone the times changed man and so did my plans as a kid I didn't want others to know they hurt me with their fiendish lies and all their stupid curiosity they thought that I would never fit into their mold they beat me up with words that cut into my soul. I really tried to fit in. I thought they'd like me if I did. That didn't matter to them. They'd fire arrows again. I always acted like it wasn't a big deal. But it really was. And I became someone who wasn't real. I'd stretch the truth to make my stories seem more interesting. And in all those pictures they were taking, I had kept on smiling. It was all just for show, to let me in their good graces. Throughout my grade school years, they'd still make me feel so worthless. I held it all back. I really tried to hold it in. But after years of regret, my heart started wearing thin. I let it all get to me worse than it had ever been. I wouldn't hide it. I would make it very obvious. That I was very crushed by things that I often took too serious. And soon those close to me begged me for answers still. But I wasn't going to tell them. And I knew I never will. However, my tender heart eventually would start to crack and bring to light the confidence that I had seemed to lack. The truth came out like I had just confessed a crime, and no one seemed to know that poor self-worth plagued my mind. Those years weren't fun times, but that doesn't mean it wasn't rough. You can have many friends, but when they leave, it's always tough. I didn't understand that the way that I always seen the world was not intended by the creator of this land unfurled. 
sometimes you don't realize you've been holding a lengthy grudge and the people, the enemy used to make you think you weren't enough. Reality hit me, flooded my brain like a water dam as I started being honest with all of my fans. I saw behind the lies my enemies left in my care, even some from the one I never really thought was there. My worth is something more than what peers say and things. I discovered that I was a fighter and had some dreams. I found the strength to not let people bring me down. And I really do feel so much better about it now. It's possible that by the end of this, you won't believe it. But I think now, for the first time, I have true confidence. Anyone else? Okay. Dr. Sung, would you like to make any closing remarks? Oh, I'm sorry. It was an announcement? Okay. I'm sorry. Pardon me. first like to announce that we will be officially publishing our third annual online edition on May 6th. Um, that's the Thursday during finals week. And we'll be hosting a launch party during that day. Um, all are encouraged to attend and support our extraordinary growth um, of our publication. We were very shocked by the number of people who uh, submitted this semester, and we are eternally grateful for how our literary journal is fastly growing. Um, so make sure to watch the CU app for more details concerning that launch party. In addition, I'm excited to announce that Novus will be featuring select poems from Anders Carlson Louise poetry book, The Low Passions. Uh, this book was previously published in 2019 by Norton. Um, as these poems are out of print, Novus will serve as their exclusive online home. So additionally, Anders was kind enough to participate in an interview with our journal, which will also be published alongside his work in our upcoming issue. So as some of you may know, and who may have even been there, um, Anders has visited uh, Cumberland before. And when he was here, he spoke highly of our English and creative writing program. Uh, actually, he commented on several occasions that he believes our students are producing master's level work. Um, coming from someone like him who has so much experience in the poetry field, we are incredibly grateful for his contribution and his support. We're so excited to share his poetry with you um, as well as all of the other wonderful submissions we received this semester. So thank you all so much for celebrating with us with our reading today and with the future launch party. Yeah, thanks. Before she goes, <laughs> I just have to take one second, 30 seconds, um, to recognize and honor Miss Jamie Fleming. She has been the work study for Novus along with Renee Boyer, who could not be here today. And I just have to tell you, when you are, it's one thing when you are a wonderful poet and a wonderful, tireless worker. It's another thing when you're also working to contribute to as a poetry citizen, of like a national poetry citizen. She has um, done everything from organizing the submissions to Google Docs to like, orchestrating the entire process of going over 200 plus submissions and um, so I just I don't know when I'll get to thank her publicly um, she's also graduating and I've gotten to have her for like four or five classes now and so I just wanted to recognize Miss Jamie Fleming and thank her for all her amazing contributions Dr. Stone. 